It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul Therod is here. He's going to dissect what we now know about Windows 8. He'll talk a little bit about Mango. Turns out he's had it for a week and a whole lot more, including the Winkle Pies. It's all coming up next on Windows Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therott, episode 214, recorded June 23rd, 2011. You say Migo, I say Mango. Windows Weekly is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. For a free trial and 30% off your new account for three months, go to Squarespace.com and use the offer code WINDOWS6. And by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to Netflix.com slash twit. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show that covers all that great stuff coming out of Redmond. All that great stuff coming out of Redmond. And here he is, that great thing coming out of Dedham, Mr. Paul Therott. Our hero, editor in chief of the super site for Windows, WinSupersite dot com. How are you? Yes, arch rival to to Gruber. I think Gruber slimed you again. I don't know that little why? whistle. I don't know why. why. Who cares? Why I... It's like he has a, a thing for you. I almost he said another word. Yeah, I think he does. It's like John. <laughs> anyway, uh, super site for Windows, great website. Love it. Love it. Um, also, the editor in chief of. Uh, the fantastic Windows Secrets books. Mm -hmm. Soon to be Windows Secrets 8. Windows 8 Secrets. Yep. Excited. Excited. Uh, how are you today, Miss? What are you, are you looking at the window? I don't know. I hear like weird <laughs> water sounds. You're hearing water? It was, That's it, not it was good. raining earlier, but now there's like a... That, you don't want to hear dripping in the, in the, stu in the office. <clears throat> no, no, I don't. No. Anyway. So uh, all well in the... World of Windows. Everything's great. <laughs> <laughs> it is kind of great, actually. It I, is. Yeah, it's been it a busy is. week. I mean, I, you know, you never know how life's going to go from a work or a personal standpoint, I suppose. But, um, you know, usually the summer's so quiet, and the summer so far has been so busy. Well, like uh, you you agreed to write a new book, which is kind of crazy. Yep. Yep. Um, and you, have you started that, or can you start? No, that? I mean we can't really actively write until September. Yeah, you know, at the build conference. I, I, there's actually, so, you know, it's funny. I suppose there's a few small. You know, we've worked up a very early version of a table of contents and all that, but it's all going to change. I mean, there's no, no reason getting can overly you, excited about that. I now. mean, you could almost start with the Windows Seven Secrets outline. No, we're we're not. We're starting from scratch. This time, I, you know, not to give too much away, but I mean. I think we've gotten to the point now where there are so many people that understand Windows that we don't have to ah, focus on the, the regular stuff anymore. That's interesting. That makes sense, actually. Yeah. So you do have, though, a very important crib sheet. I mean, in fact, the only really useful crib sheet, which is Stephen Sanofsky's, Sanofsky's mm -hmm. uh, All Things D speech. It's now out on video for those who want to see it. Yep. Um, yeah, had so you I seen the whole thing or before? No, because – so I, I just wanted to provide this as a bit of background. I mean, they just it, put that up today. It was – I think they put it up a couple of days ago. But the conference itself was about three weeks ago. Yeah. And the way they do this conference is it's, it's private. You know, they don't – you can't watch the video live, uh, or let alone, you know, straight well, later. you have to pay a lot of money. Until weeks sure. later. Yeah. Yeah, so they provided an official live blog, um, which at the time, you know, we – you sort of take it at face value. I mean, I didn't – assume it was all that bad, but there was a certain amount of information in it. And I wrote an article based on that. Um, Microsoft at the time had two other Windows 8 reveals that they did. One was at that Computex show, remember Taipei. Right. And the other one was a video by Jensen Harris, um, who was, uh, I think he's, a, I don't want to say his job title, I forget what it is, but he works on the Windows user uh, interface, user experience. Um, each of these three things provided some amount of information about Windows 8. So I wrote a bunch of articles at the time. 
sometime after the conference was over, they published a bizarrely an edited version of the video that was just, um, I want to say it was about 30% or maybe less of the total content. And then you, you watch that and you realize that Sanofsky said things that were never reported in that live blog. Oh, dear. In some cases, they duplicated information that was provided in the Computex show, um, which I thought was unique to that talk. Right. And in some cases, he provided information that was not revealed anywhere else. And so uh, some people, began, myself and others, began pestering these guys, you know, when, when's the video coming out? Like, release the whole thing. Why, why, would you really, why would you go to the trouble to edit it? You know, and release that. So finally this week they released the full video. And actually now I sort of understand why they edited it because the hosts of that show were, were horrible. I Walt, mean, horrible. Walt, Walt Mossberg? They, if you, you could just go through it. and uh, They interrupted yeah. Stephen Sanofsky. Well, remember, in, Walt it, is it, in Apple's back pocket. Well, there's no doubt about it because there's a 20-minute period. I think it's 22 minutes long. He interrupted him 30 times. Wow, that's worse than me. And interrupted him while he was trying to answer stupid questions that he had asked. You know, right. and it, it's really irritating. And but the, and as troubling, there are were crucial bits of information where uh, actually two of them, they interrupted while they were revealing, <sighs> and then they were never actually fully revealed. <sighs> I hate that. Yeah, it's really aggravating. And then there were some just some bits of information that uh, around what things are called, what the names of things are, and so forth. Um, that you know would would never provided through the live blog. You know that there's just a, there was just a bunch of good information. I'm not going to go through everything I have but in this now, list. Now, in fact, you say though that that, that Walt was kind of attacking. You f you felt Walt was kind of a, attacking him. I felt that he was unprofessional. He never he asked berating questions that had nothing to do with the topic at hand, th and then refused to let the guy actually answer those questions. Yeah. I, I, I find the whole thing to be bizarre. I, the thing I've always said about people uh, who are in the mainstream press is this. You know, when you write for, and, and I'm not Walt, actually Walt writes for the Wall Street Journal. He's the, Right, so I was actually going to name guy. the three big publications. And he and was, I, he was uh, originally a general interest reporter. Yeah, I think he was their yeah. D.C. guy. Yep. And, I don't know. and I don't, then don't. became a tech reporter uh, just a few, you know, I don't know, 10 years I, ago. I, you write for the Wall Street Journal, you write for the New York Times, you write for USA Today, if you write for the Washington Post, the San Francisco Chronicle, the LA Times, the Boston Globe, whatever you want to pick, you have a responsibility. You know, he has an uncanny, uh, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but, but Walt is yep. my inspiration. He has an uncanny resemblance to the Moss Puppet that we had on earlier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think that's by design. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, anyway, you um, write for the Journal, the, the USA Today. I think you have the, a responsibility yeah. to be uh, unbiased. And to present things the way they really are. I, I think that it's okay to have an opinion, of course. I think that's what a commentator or an analyst does. And he is uh, a reviewer, he, so he has... He, well, he, he builds it. himself as a reporter. Yeah, that's not right. No, I'm sorry, but that's not what he does. And I... Uh, you know, you can, you can read my transcript, you can watch the video, I don't care. But either one will show you something that I think is not very pretty. I, the, the level of disrespect is something he would never have shown to, say, Stephen Jobs, who he's also interviewed in the past. Um, it's bizarre. So I'm not going to, I don't want to talk about that, actually. I don't really care. I, 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 I'm not impressed by this guy or what he does, and this is just another example of it. Well, but, and there's some palpable frustration because here you are trying to write, a, you know, getting ready for Windows 8, trying this, to Here I am trying this. to learn more about Windows 8, the topic yeah. at hand, and this organization is doing everything they can, from what I can tell, to prevent that information, it, it, you know, from getting out into the real world. Which makes no sense. I guess. <laughs> Did you hear so, any 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 rumors, anything uh, that maybe Stephen himself was perturbed by the interview? Did I guess he'd be more classy than to say anything like that? Yeah, I mean, I he, listen. Uh, he had to have known what he was getting into uh, doing the show. He's known Walter Mossberg for many many years, and the other people involved with the show, so uh, they know. And we had talked about this before. Um, Microsoft followed a, a certain schedule for Windows Seven. Uh, part of that schedule involved appearing at what at the time was the D6 conference three years previous. Um, they were going to duplicate that schedule essentially for Windows 8. And, you know, so here they go. They, uh, they arrive at the D9 conference. And it, it's, it's just part of their scheduled reveal, you know, for this product. And, and okay, that's fine. I, I have some side issues with, you know, a media organization holding information from other media organizations, that kind of thing. But honestly, that's not my big problem. I... I it almost doesn't matter. I'm more concerned about knowing what's really going on with the Windows 8. I mean, you know, because we've talked about it, there are, there are questions. You know, developers have questions about this HTML interface. 
is that going to be the only thing that they can use to program to this new UI? Interestingly, Stephen Sanofsky actually addresses that. Um, so we, and, and in a way that maybe I think people might not be too happy with. Um, uh, so uh, anyway, I, I went through when the when the video came out. I went through it and for many many hours sat, and listened, and rewound, and listened and rewound, and listened and wrote. And I originally, I originally what I was going to do was write an article that I'll, I'll probably still write um, that will summarize the new information, the things that I think are new, and discuss them a little bit with actual quotes. But then I thought, you know, maybe this whole my notes, the, the actual transcription, maybe this will be interesting to people. So I decided to release it over three days, uh, three separate articles, dealing with the three parts of the interview. And so there's an inter interview between Mossberg and, and Sanofsky. There's a demo part in which um, Julie Larson-Green from Microsoft and Kara Swisher from uh, All Things D participate. And then there's a Q&A at the end, which is curiously is mostly Walter Mossberg now interviewing them again, and then a couple of questions from the audience. Um, you know, and it's, I mean, I think the whole thing's pretty, horrible but you know but whatever so there it is so i i you know i've done what i can do um but <laughs> i've but, done all i can <laughs> um but there's some interesting bit bits of information so some of the things that they say i'll just i'm not gonna i i made you a list here but yeah I'm not, look at a I great list so give us as much yeah. as you can well i'll give you some of the ones i think are really interesting but just before you do just out of curiosity somebody said this in the in the chat room and i think it's a good question yeah um microsoft does have channel line i mean channel line is a great resource they could uh, manage their own presentations. Why don't they? It's an in-house video yep. network that's bigger than Twit. I mean, it's huge. Yeah, but it's not the mainstream media. You know, this is a chance to get. Yeah, I guess you know right. there, there is a there is a business aspect to the Wall Street Journal that speaks to an audience that's very important to Microsoft that isn't addressed by Channel Nine, which is essentially a developer or enthusiast that's a good point. Yeah, video channel. That's a good so, point. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, you although can, I would question whether this is mainstream media, all things D is really observed by the tech enthusiast community. You think the business? No, no, of course. But because it's associated because with the Wall the Street Journal, Journal, this information right. would be reported through the Wall Street Journal. Right. Well, yeah. what it does show you is, I mean, if 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 you're if you're to be believed, and I believe you, that okay. there might be some bias uh, in the journal's coverage. Uh, I don't know. Actually, I don't. I don't know what to say to that because. Um, one thing I've had a big problem with lately is I, I subscribe to the New York Times. I notice incredible bias in the various reporters there in their articles about whatever, about technology. And I notice this because, of course, I write about technology. It's a problem knowing too much about something because you're never yeah. happy with <laughs> right. what you see elsewhere. Right. Um, but you have bias too, right? I mean, we all have bias. We're human beings. Yeah. But again, like I, my. My point is that when you write for a mainstream publication like that, you have a greater responsibility. Um, if I, I'm a Windows guy, so naturally I see things through sort of a Windows-colored uh, glasses or whatever. But, you know, I don't write for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. Now, I subscribe to the Wall Street Journal online. I don't, I don't get uh, an electronic version on my Kindle or the paper version at home or whatever. Um, I don't see the same bias in Wall Street Journal that I do in the New York Times. I will say that. I think they do very, uh, very good reporting in general. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm just throwing that one out there. As, as far as straight reporting goes, um, no. Wal Walter Mossberg uh, writes a personal tech column with uh, Catherine, somebody, Bo, or whatever her name is. Mm -hmm. um, I've always found her articles to be of high quality, and I've never suspected her of anything uh, untoward or whatever. So, uh, no, I, don't, I certainly don't have the issues with that publication that I do with the New York Times with regards to tech reporting. So I get there's that for you. But um, with regards to Windows 8, though, you know, there, it's funny because really they explicitly answer a lot of the things that were kind of questions for people. In fact, one of the ones that you uh, had raised and, and or maybe Dvorak or whatever was, you know, this new UI. And if it's like it's like touch based or touch centric or whatever, um, Mike uh, Sanofsky and uh, Larson Green both repeatedly repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly said, no, it's not touch-centric, it's touch-first. Well, that's an interesting distinction. Yeah, and they actually compared it to touch-centric. Um, the idea was that it is, yes, it, it will work well with touch. It's not touch added to something else. If you think about the way Windows 7 works with uh, touch and multi-touch, and most people probably don't even know that that's there, but uh, it is essentially the, the standard Windows desktop with a um, sort of an invisible layer over the top of it that allows you to use your, your finger 
kind of like a mouse. And you can do squeezing and pinching and stuff like that, but it's it's a thing on a thing in a way, right? It's a, it's We have this Windows UI. <laughs> you want to use it with multi-touch. Okay, we'll add that to it. What they're saying is this new UI was designed from the ground up. It was designed for touch first, yes. But we've also engineered it so that it works correctly, and this is the point I was trying to make with uh, earlier, with all of these other things that you know and love or use today with Windows, and that means keyboard and mouse primarily, but also other, other input types. Uh, if you had a stylus and a tablet PC, um, you know, that kind of stuff. So there's, there's, there are other ways of interacting with it. So that was confusing to people, but they had actually clearly explained that. It's just that it wasn't, you know, we didn't, we, we got it through a, a filter, you know, at all things D. So we never really got that clearly. There, there's one, the one big negative, and you can go in and read this for yourself. Um, Sanofsky is talking about how they came up with this UI and how Windows is adapting to the way that people are using computing devices. And what I got out of that was, you know, they're not really leading anymore. You know, remember the Alan K quote was something like the best way to uh, predict the future predict the future is to invent it. it. Yeah. That's not what they're doing here, right? What, what he said was, you know, we looked at what's going on in the world with phones. We looked at what's going on with tablets, touch interfaces. And we asked ourselves, what else can Windows do? You know, so they're, they're, they're changing Windows to adapt to this reality, which is fine and logical and understandable, but it also shows that, that it's not really leadership, right? They're just, they're adapting to the world. You know, there was a time when they kind of set the agenda, uh, Microsoft, and you kind of get the feeling now they're reacting, mm -hmm. you know. And I don't mean uh, that to put like a big blanket over anything, but I mean, I, I just think it's important to point out the, the good and the bad, you know. I think that's um, a, it's a mature company with a mature product, and they have a commitment sure. to legacy support. So that, I think that puts them in the backseat as far as yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gra grandiose um, change. Yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. where, and you know, look at all the heat Apple's getting for the change on Final Cut Pro. Um, <laughs> and, but, 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 and that's, I, that is such a small market. But oh, yeah, I okay. know, but that's why they can do it, sure. right? And well, they no, can, actually, they can afford I, I don't know. They, uh, you know what? I wouldn't say that's why. I would say they've gotten away with it in the past because that's always been the case. Right. Uh, that's just the way Apple does things. You know, they're very aggressive. They're aggressive to the point of pain, you know. But watch, because uh, I wonder if the, for instance, iOS uh, uh, interface, which is now really entrenched, I yep. wonder if they'll feel as free to change that as they I'm, have been. I am also watching that very carefully. So uh, I will say you can see a glimpse of the future in iOS with this Twitter integration. Uh, the two things I would say to that are, one, is that is a, a very deliberate and obvious attempt to copy what is a core uh, bit of Windows Phone functionality, a deep integration with an online service that you don't control across all of the apps that you do control in your own operating system. It's very Windows Phone-esque. The other thing I would point out that I don't know, that, I don't know why this hasn't gotten more conversation, but... Not Twitter, huh? Not Facebook? Oh, really? No, we talked I mean, a lot about that. I okay, thought that was I, so a I don't very know, but I was get, clear know, slap in the face to the Facebook. But, well, here's the thing, and I, I don't think this gets enough attention. Microsoft and Facebook are huge partners. Yep. They're, they're like BFFs, and I don't know why or how that happened, but Facebook has basically turned its back on Google and now Apple in various ways and has continued to partner with Microsoft. So in Windows Phone Mango, the second version, which we'll talk about a little bit more later in the show, there is even deeper integration with Facebook. And it has now gotten to the point where, uh, obviously, you have to go sign up for Facebook on the web. But once you do that, you can interact with Facebook, basically. Do everything you need to do in Facebook without ever loading a Facebook application or visiting the web app, uh, the web site on the phone. Everything is built in. It's so deeply integrated into the phone. I find that very interesting. It's kind of a side conversation, but I, I like that though. I have to say, this is one of the things I loved about you know setting up. And you told me to do this: set up live.com, and then when you get the phone, it's just all going to kind of work. And I thought that was really nicely. Yeah, and it's done. and it's I mean five times better in Mango. So yeah. they've really improved that. It's interesting, but anyway, um, one of the big arguments about Windows 8 and and when we speak generally about the future, you know, does it make sense to uh, kind of go down market like we talked about uh, with Windows? Uh, go from a PC down to a tablet or an even smaller device? Or do you kind of go up market? You know, you take a, 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 an OS like a web OS or iOS or something that you created for like a PDA or a smartphone, and then you move it up to a tablet. And then maybe to sort of, um, in the future, something that's more of a mainstream computing device or something, you know, which 
which way more, makes more sense. And people have fallen very cleanly on either side of this divide. Um, I, he said something very interesting about this. You know, first, you know, m Windows is not this big, gigantic thing, you know, that people think it is, for one thing. This is a very common, I don't want to call it a myth, but more of a misunderstanding that Windows is so ginormous that it couldn't possibly work on something with fairly low system resources. He said, you know, Microsoft looked out at the market and they said, this is what we see. We see smartphones that have one gigahertz processors. They have 256 to 512 megabytes of RAM. They have dedicated storage and they have a GPU. And then once you move up to a slate, you're talking one gig of RAM and the next year will be two gigabytes of RAM. Well, guess what? Those are all the minimum system requirements for Windows. You can run Windows on a phone. Now, it doesn't make sense to run a desktop version of Windows on a phone because that user interface doesn't make any sense on that device. But, you know, that was where they saw the market going. So now you have Windows with the advantages of that. You have a new UI, which is touch and multi-touch enabled and all that. And then if you wanted to, you could add a keyboard and a mouse to it. And guess what? It's a laptop computer. Uh, and it does run Word and Excel and all that stuff. It's so, kind of amazing, actually. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, he uh, talked about what, you know, what Mossberg called their marketing line, um, kind of snarkily, but actually accurately, too. You know, that Windows 8 is the no compromises tablet because, you know, you're going to have these devices that have the iPod, iPad form factor, the size and the thinness, uh, the instant resume, you know, the quick boot and all that stuff. But full compatibility, not just with Windows software, but all those peripherals, um, printers and scanners, you know, you can plug in external hard drives, you can access the file system, <laughs> you know, all, all the stuff you can't do. Um, you know, there are, there's a downside to Windows, of course, or around security software, like you pointed out fairly endlessly. But you know, you know, that's an interesting way to market this. And I think we'll speak to a pretty big audience, you know, that Windows 8 on a tablet is essentially the, you know, the no compromises um, tablet, you know, of the future or whatever. So you I know, thought that was kind of interesting. You know, what I find was uh, very interesting is that they started Windows 8 development before they started, they released Windows 7. So it was, before they released it, yeah. Well, they had finalized it. Remember, there was some period of months. Um, yeah, they don't like to talk about that at the time. That's kind of intriguing <laughs> you know. to me. Yeah, they're always on the next one, you know. So, yeah, but that I yeah. understand. But I, I thought that they waited till the till it shipped before they started the next. See how it does, you know. <laughs> but the, yeah. what that implies uh, is it's a different team. Well, yeah, I don't, I can't speak to that anymore. I mean, the, the Windows used to follow a very specific kind of trajectory with regards to who did what and all that kind of stuff. So you had this team that was working on the next version, but the second that you shipped it. It would it would move over to the uh, the same team that did the service packs, so it would sort of ship into maintenance mode, if you right, will. Right. That that was a different group of people, and I, I, they may do that differently now. That was from years ago. I really don't know. Um, but no, I think it's the same people. But okay. you know, basically, uh, if you think about the schedule, Windows Seven was feature complete in October two thousand. Oh, okay. Eight. Right. You know. So, so they, from they, then until the following yeah. summer, they were just fixing bugs. That makes sense. Then. Addressing feedback and so forth. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think they, that freed them up to um, start thinking ahead to the next version. One of the things that I had speculated on, and and not like rampant speculation, but based on how Microsoft does things today, was that and and one of the arguments I had made about that new UI was that this thing, how this thing would be perfect for all these different situations. And I said, remember, imagine a corporate desktop where they want to lock this thing down and they could just put the two, three, five tiles or whatever that represented the only applications we want you to ever see or run. It would be very easy to lock this thing down. Uh, they tried to explain that right in the middle of the talk and someone cut, it was uh, Julie Larson Green, I think it was saying at the time, she was cut off, never finished it. You can tell from the sentence she was saying that's where she was going. And then at the end of the talk, uh, Stephen Sanofsky suddenly uh, blurted out a line like, you know, I think it's important to remember that uh, all these capabilities we have today for corporations that want to lock down the desktops can do that. And he explicitly said exactly what um, I knew would be the case, simply that this UI uh, also makes it very nice to do that kind of thing. Um, has to. Yeah. Has to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what, we were, so, that's what I was referring to before, is that Microsoft has always been very careful to protect legacy, especially in business. Yeah, that's, there that's was a lot one. of cluelessness around the legacy stuff, you know, because the guys from uh, D9 wanted desperately for this thing to somehow be available only in this tablet UI. You know, could you just ship a version without the desktop? And it's like, guys. What do they care? <laughs> the, I, well, you can use it like that if you want, right? I mean, there's nothing 
<laughs> stopping you from never using the desktop, I suppose. But we can't force PC makers to do that, and they can't force us to do that for them. So, I mean, people buy Windows and they expect it to be Windows. You know, that's the point. It's Windows. You know, it has to run that stuff. They'll always offer new capabilities. You know, Microsoft does not like Apple aggressively chop off stuff at the knees. They, they deprecate it, right? Program Manager was available in Windows, I, I believe, all the way through XP, if I'm not mistaken. Um, That's true. Yeah, you're some right. Some huge amount of time after it was no longer the main show. Um, that's the way they typically do things. So assuming this takes off, assuming this is a big deal, assuming there's a Windows 9 where maybe they go uh, and further that UI, it's possible that uh, over time as people run fewer and fewer of these legacy applications, you know, the traditional desktop will be deprecated further. Um, and we'll reach a point, you know, Windows 10 or whatever, where we just don't need that anymore. I mean, that's the way Microsoft does things. I'm trying to look and see if there's anything else here that's in, really important. I think um, Silverlight. Yeah, the biggest one would be Silverlight. So obviously the big controversy that has arisen in the wake of this thing was that Microsoft is, you know, for God, they said it over and over again. Uh, sometimes it was described as HTML5 and JavaScript. Sometimes it was described as HTML5, JavaScript, and CSS3. But Basically, web standards, APIs, user interface, this is how you would make it. Never, ever does the topic of native code come up. Um, there is a Q&A at the end of this talk, and it's actually the guy from Seismic. Um, Was it Loic? Yeah, Loic. Uh, oh, Loic Lemur. You know, he says, I've written all this stuff in... <laughs> in Silverlight. <clears throat> yeah, so, Seismic's in Silverlight. Well, he says, so he asked this question right up front. And... Um, I should almost go back. I should almost go read his actual thing rather than my note. But um, so Sanofsky answers his question, but he basically answers it to the tune of, um, you know, your Silverlight apps will continue. First, he says Silverlight will run in the browser. So there's this version of IE that comes in Windows 8 called IE 10. Um, the version they showed off in all of the demos was this um, tailored application, what we used to call or thought was going to be called an immersive application, that runs full screen. You do the, the swiping gestures. You know, you can swipe from the bottom, swipe from the top to get application UI to come up. It's all invisible by default. But if you run that browser on the traditional Windows desktop, it looks just like IE9 does today or somewhat like IE9 does today in that it is a traditional-looking Windows application. So it runs in, this one app runs in both ways. Um, those Silverlight web apps will still run fine in there, he says. Um, let me just find the exact... Uh, Exact part of this because I want to. You know, the, as you look for that, there's an interesting discussion. We talked about this yesterday on uh, on security. Now, the Microsoft yep. started to deprecate WebGL, which yeah. is um, kind of OpenGL on the web. Google's yep. pushing it as as a way to kind of um, add this kind of capability. I think to HTML5. Yep. And Microsoft says it's not safe, which is ironic because of course Microsoft <laughs> created OctaVex, which is exactly yep, yep. you know they said you can run arbitrary code, um, but I'm wondering. Um, if Silverlight isn't kind of the same thing, and maybe that's why they're backing off Silverlight. This is a weird one. Because, well, I don't know that they are, so I, I want to get that one out there. So obviously there's a Silverlight. There's a version of Silverlight that was in Windows Phone 7 that was a little bit behind the times for the time. There's a newer version of Silverlight. There's a new, that version of Silverlight is involved in the Windows Phone 7.5 or whatever they call that, Mango version that comes out this year. Um, Silverlight still, I mean, based on, I mean, I... The stuff I can't talk about, but I mean, I've heard that Silverlight is still a very important thing strategically. So I still do believe that, and I've also seen things, you know, with Raphael through uh, Windows 8 uh, leaked builds that there is this native code thing going on in there. So I, I do believe in September we're going to learn more. But he he really stayed very close to the to the you know the the TOC on this one. I mean, um, he told the guy that the Silverlight stuff would still run. That all the other browsers would run, and they run Silverlight. Like that helps at all. Silver Silverlight applications, or WPF applications on Windows, will still, of course, run. It's backwards compatible. It's Windows. Um, but then he's, you know, he says, like, you know, developers always have to make trade-offs. Um, you know, we support different. We support the most different ways of writing software. He said, there is an opportunity for you to reach the most different platforms by targeting the one that we have, which is kind of an odd thing to say, but. Later, later in the Q&A, uh, Julie Larson Green talks about an interesting new thing with regards to this HTML and JavaScript thing, which is that it's not just 
a web page. It's not limited like that. That there are going to be these APIs where you can access things like uh, DirectX graphics or the file system or the network or devices that are connected to your computer and that you'll do so through HTML5 and JavaScript. And if I could speculate a bit, because I have to, because we really just don't know exactly what form this takes. Um, if you're a developer, you might be familiar with the notion of um, uh, the way that Microsoft developer tools and, and, and platforms work today is there's a, there's a code thing that you can do, like in C Sharp, you know, you code normally. But then there's also this, I, I want to say it's, I'm not a programmer anymore, but like a declarative form of programming where you're programming on sort of a, in a uh, markup language, like right. SAML right. or XML or whatever. And that is possible uh, to map, you know, XAML plus C Sharp to HTML and CSS plus JavaScript, right? Those are kinds of, kind of the same things. Now, maybe there will be a visual designer where what you're constructing is uh, HTML with CSS for the UI, and that the code underneath th that will be accessing those APIs that she was mentioning would be based in, in JavaScript. And in, and in some ways, this would be elevating JavaScript um, you know, up to the territory of C-sharp, I guess, um, maybe making it a full-fledged .NET programming language, which it may or may not be already. I have no idea. So uh, still some questions there. But I, I, you know, when asked explicitly about Silverlight, he did not betray even the slightest glimp of, glimpse of hope that there would be a native <laughs> Silverlight API in Windows 8. I thought that was so bizarre. Yeah. Um, when that guy asked that question, I, I sort of, jumped up alert like, oh my God, this is it. He's going to have to say something, right? Yes or no? Anything? And he really doesn't. Um, very careful answer uh, that never... Well, that says everything. Yeah. Right? Because if they were committed, they'd say, oh yes. It makes me wonder. And it, it, yeah. it, it makes me wonder because, again, I've seen so much and heard so much. Multiple sources... Um, well, you know, you know the, who else uses not, Silverlight that uh, would not be happy about this? Netflix. Well, but remember, that, um, that would still work, right? Uh, yeah, but you don't want to use something that's on its way out. I, well, assuming it is. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm not convinced that it is. I, in fact, if I were going to get, if I were going to bet money on it, I would bet that there is a future for Silverlight. There will be future Silverlight questions that. So, uh, our versions rather, and um, so what? What's his hesitance to say that? I don't know. You know, there there was a reluctance on the part of Microsoft, uh, both uh, Sanofsky and Larson Green, to go beyond the script. You know. Oh, okay. Um, they were there, and they tried to rein this in a number of times when it tried to go outside of this, where it was like, "Look, we're here to show off the Windows 8 UI. Um, we want to highlight the fact that these applications will be very easy to write." HTML5, and that was kind of it, <laughs> you know. I mean, there were some details around how certain things in the UI worked, like that snap feature where you could have two apps side by side. But, you know, there was a point where the, there's a Windows 8 side UI that comes up when you swipe from the right side of the screen. There's a start button and some other buttons. They didn't want to talk about that at all, let alone discuss what the name of that thing was. Uh, and finally, they said, look, we'll, we'll talk about it more in... Uh, in September, you know, they really, they, they, they had a very specific script that they wanted to stick to. And you can tell because they kept repeating the same exact phrases over and over again. We wanted it to be fluent and fluid. And, you know, we wanted, you know, they, it was the same stuff over and over again. I mean, um, so they had a very uh, set goal of what they would reveal and what they wouldn't. And I guess they stuck to it. So, yeah, I, you know, and I could see that maybe they want to keep options open or they don't want to, I don't know. I, I, by the way, that is absolutely the thing, and that's important. It's important to remember what we know about Steven Snofsky because he's running the show. This is a guy who will never reveal anything he's until prudent. it's going to happen. He's prudent. Well, it's, 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 it's calculated, you know. Well, that's why, you know, when you said, uh, well, someone said, you know, well, how do we know this is the, what if it changes? no. When when he shows it, that's it. This right. is happening. Right. Um, his reluctance to talk about this other stuff doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It doesn't mean that it's going to happen. Um, it it at least me, it either means it could mean that, but it could also mean that it's just not ready. He's not comfortable discussing it because he can't guarantee anything. Yeah. You know. 
That could be it. I and I think that's it's so unusual to have an executive <laughs> who's not a blabbermouth. Uh, yeah. And it, and and so unusual that when it happens with a with somebody like Sanofsky or, or Steve Jobs, it's it's notable. Yep. And and that's not such a bad thing. I think it's a, probably a good thing. It's probably yeah, good it's business. It's exactly what they need. I mean, actually, yeah. I mean, I think it's a good thing. But it, it's there's no wiggle room. You know, you don't. Uh, Snofsky and Steve Jobs are in some ways very similar. You know, what you see is what you get kind of thing. And, and um, Well, you know who's particularly tight-lipped? This guy, <laughs> this guy over here, Paul Therott. Where is he? There. He is very, he has had, <laughs> where? <laughs> he has had mango for 10 days and has kept yep. it to himself. So we're going to get a little peek at mango in just a moment. We will also talk about what the Nokia N9 tells us about the next Windows phone which should be interesting. But before we do that, can we take a little break, Paul? Sure. You could have an Odwalla. Enjoy a mango tango right now. <laughs> a refreshing beverage. There you go. A glass of Everclear. And we'll be back. It's absinthe. <laughs> absinthe. Mm. But first, I want to talk about the secret behind exceptional websites. It's our great friends at squarespace.com. Com. If you don't have a website yet, you need a website. And a Facebook page doth not a website make. Having a Twitter page doesn't do anything for you. You've got to have a website. And you've got to have a website that you control uh, that is kind of your, your place on the web. And boy, this is doubly true if you're a business. If you're a business and you're not on the web, you don't, as far as I'm concerned, and I think that this is probably true of a whole generation of users, you don't exist. It's like not having a Yellow Pages entry or something, except that nobody cares about the Yellow Pages anymore. It's all about the web. I want you to go to squarespace.com and take a look at it. Actually, the best thing to do, I'm going to tell you about some of the features in a second, but the best thing to do is go to squarespace.com and click the green, big green, try it free button. Now, you're going to create your site URL. By the way, you can change this later, so, you know, uh, curl up and die hair salon. And then you have a password, and then you have an email address, and boom, you're in. For two weeks, you have absolute access to every bit of the functionality on squarespace.com. Now, I should explain, Squarespace is both hosting and software. So you don't have to go out and look for a web host now. You don't have to download and install software. You don't even have to keep that software up to date because they do it for you. You get some great features. The iPhone, iPad app makes it so easy not only to post but also to moderate. Importing and exporting from your existing site using the uh, big four APIs, Movable Type, WordPress, TypePad, and Blogger. Notice I said in and out, and it preserves all links. It, it, the SEO is preserved. The images are preserved. The comments are even preserved. This is a really sweet system. Uh, templates. Oh, yeah, you got templates. But the beauty of it is it's so customizable that no two uh, Squarespace sites look the same. Form building, data collection, and a whole lot more. So 14 days free without a credit card, just with that big green button. And then once you decide, hey, I think I got something I like, uh, you can sign up, and I, if you do, I would like you to use the offer code WINDOWS6. That's W-I-N-D-O-W-S and the number 6, all one word, because well, you'll want to. It gives you 30% off for the first three months. So prices uh, as low as $10 a month, and then additional 30% off for the first three months really make this a very affordable way to try Squarespace.com. The secret behind exceptional websites. Go to squarespace.com right now. Try it for free. And if you decide to stick around, and I know you will, I know so many people so happily use Squarespace, use the offer code WINDOWS6 for 30% off for three months. Squarespace.com. Leo Laporte with Paul Thrutt. So you, you, did you put Mango on your focus? How do you, how, how, well, how, how do you do that? Um, actually, they just gave me a phone with awesome. Mango on it. Yeah. Awesome. And now you can speak? Yes. How did that, what happened? With what? I mean, <laughs> did they, did, I mean, what, uh, isn't it a little early to be talking about it? It's, when's it come out? Not for six months. Uh, no, I think it should be. September? We don't know exactly. I would think September, October. Oh, okay. October. Probably. All right. It's pretty much on the same trajectory that Windows Phone was last year. So. All right. And uh, you know, will you update in, uh, uh, the book? Yeah, um, I'm, there's not going to be a new version of the book, but I am going to update uh, the book electronically, if you will, oh, that's uh, cool. with the support of the publishing company. So um, I'll have some details about that later. But um, Do you yeah. have a site for the book now? 
Yep, windowsphonesecrets.com. Oh. So, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, there'll be some, there'll be some stuff. I, we, you know, there's an understanding that, um, you know, Windows Phone right now isn't exactly taking the world by storm. I don't know if you've noticed. Uh, but there is an expectation that it will. And um, so we're going to keep the fire burning, if you will. And, you know, I've kept a blog going the whole year, and I'll keep doing that. I, you know, I love Windows Phone and enjoy being part of that. So, so your Mango uh, hands-on is actually on the site now. If you, if folks yeah, it's on, well, those link to the Superset articles. What, what I did was I, I just wrote a traditional overview. But uh, as with the Sanofsky uh, transcript stuff, I, I was taking this document, you know, using this document as notes. And I thought, you know, this might actually be of interest to people. It's just kind of rough notes about, you know, every little thing I've noticed that's changed. Um, Oh, that's a lot of notes. Holy yeah, that's, just, that's just the, that's the regular article. But yeah, the, the notes I just go through app by app and, and, and talk about all the little changes. You know, if you're familiar with the way that iOS is evolving these days, I mean, I think what's happening in Windows Phone is very similar in the sense that it's not, you know, we're not going to come out with V2 and have it be completely different. You know, they, they did all that hard work already, right? Um, they like the direction they're heading in um, from a usage or a user experience standpoint, maybe. And uh, so they're expanding on that. So I mentioned earlier, um, you know, V1 of Windows Phone came with nice um, Facebook integration pieces. Windows Phone V2 or Mango or 7.5 or whatever you want to call it is going to have enhanced uh, Facebook. And, and, and like I said, it's really, really cool. It's, it's like the full Facebook experience, but spread all over the phone and all the places that make sense. And it also is going to have integration with uh, Twitter and with LinkedIn as well. And live, you know, Windows Live, which was there previously. Um, so that stuff's neat. And then, you know, most of it is um, is evolutionary, I guess. I mean, you can kind of step through the stuff that matters the most. I mean, the browser is a significant update. You know, the first version was okay. This version is fully standards compliant based on IE9 on the desktop. It's got the same rendering engine. It does hardware accelerated uh, graphics and so forth. Um, much, much better. So... You know, I think one of the big advantages of the iPhone platform for many years now has been this great mobile browser that they have. And I would say that this puts uh, Windows Phone into that category, you know, where websites actually render the way you expect them to. And uh, uh, it'll be available for all existing Windows phones. Yep, for free. Yeah, for everybody. That's nice. Yeah. You know, everything's better. I mean, um, they don't fix every single little problem, you know, and there's, there are some weird issues right now where I don't know if they're going to be resolved. So, for example... Uh, in the first version, it would work with all these different calendar types, um, but only with the primary calendar, which is a huge limitation. Now, in V2 here, they've added the support for multiple calendars from the same source for any Exchange ActiveSync-based uh, calendar service. So that includes Hotmail and Exchange and Office 365. Also, it should include Google Calendar, but right now in, in, in the beta version, Google Calendar works as it does before. It only integrates with the first calendar, not with um, any secondary calendars. So I, I don't know why that is or if it's going to change, but my hope and expectation is that by the time this thing ships, you'll be able to get multiple calendars from the same Google Calendar account into there as well. So that works nice. Um, it does tasks, you know, to-do type things from also from Exchange ActiveSync. So if you have a Hotmail Calendar or uh, Exchange slash... Um, Office 365 tasks, you know, have finally been integrated. That's one of the things people were asking for. It does background audio and all that stuff. So um, you can play music in the background from any app um, and go do other things, you know, like on, like on any other modern smartphone. Isn't that nice? Um, it integrates the playback controls onto the lock screen and stuff, so you can do all that kind of good stuff. Um, the camera remembers settings, which was a huge problem in V1 um, for me in particular. And uh, they fixed that, so that's great. You know, you know the Xbox Live stuff is better. Um, I mean, virtually everything is is better. I mean, it's just kind of a it's nice. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know you. You know, I want to talk a little bit about the N9 uh, because yeah. it's just crazy. It's like Nokia is shipping this phone that they. I know. It's going to be the first and last phone running Mego. Which is their kind from of that? Well, from them. I mean, assuming Migo is like the sob of the technology. Migo's dead. They, Come they, they on. Could, they could continue, but it's going to be some weird Chinese mafia organization that's running it. Or... <laughs> you think they'll sell it? I don't know. I think the N9 is, is kind of beautiful looking, but I bought the N8 and I'm not falling for it. I, right, which is too bad because I actually think the N9 is beautiful. Yeah. It's all glass. There's no today. buttons. It's, uh, it's sweet. 
Yes, it looks good. I mean, it really does. But uh, Stephen Elop was at a, an internal event, and somebody recorded it behind his back, and he showed off the first Windows phone, and it is that exact hardware. What? Oh, so good. Yeah, so that hardware is more than a hint, I think, of what you can expect to see from their Windows phone in October. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So if, and I, I like that uh, people have likened it to the iPod Nano, I guess. You know, not the current one, but the previous one. It's got that kind of, especially when you look at it from end, like from the end, it's got yeah. that, I don't know what to call it, kind of a curved uh, cylindrical. It, yeah, but is it, is, I, I'm looking at a, the Engadget video yeah. of it right now. Mm -hmm. Is it uh, rubberized? Is it metal? Is it plastic? No, it's metal. It's colorized metal and it's colorized scratch metal. resistant. Colorized Ooh, metal, yeah. That's neat. Yeah. Not a powder coat. It's got Gorilla Glass. Beautiful. It's yeah, beautiful. it's a work of art. Yeah. So, uh, running an operating system no one wants. No one cares about it. Well, it look, it looks pretty, but it looks pretty good. I mean, that's the thing. I, I have to say. It is Windows we, Phone 7 a little bit. I mean, it's swipey. Yeah. Well, it, you know, it's funny. They're using these um, the side swipes. You know, you swipe right. from the edge of a screen, and that's very Windows 8-esque. Um, that might be a, a coincidence. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sure guessing they're not going to sue them for patent infringement. But <laughs> <laughs> given that they're such a huge partner. Right. Um, Anyway, I, I again, I, the N9 is a. Uh, well, that a looks a little friend. bit like an iPhone. I think they're going to get yeah, sued by Apple icons, right there, you know. boy. Holy cow! If yep. Samsung got sued, sure. Okay, but now this. Okay, that. Mm. I'm very confused. I'm watching a video, <laughs> folks. Just to yeah, no, I'm all. watching. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm watching it with you. Yeah. Um, this is one of those. It's hard because when you love technology, it's easy to get taken away with something like this. Right, but you want to resist this one, right? Because this is yeah. We, I think we all end. understand it. this thing is a lame duck. So yeah. it's a tough one because you look at it and it's like this is this is nice, you know. And I think for the people who feel that Nokia maybe are going down the wrong path, they're going to point to this and say, "See, see, you know, this would have been nice." But honestly, as as nice as this OS sort of is, let's be honest, right? This is just yet another multi-touch UI. It's there's no big differentiator yeah, that you see nothing. in this video. Uh, I'd love to see Mango running on this though. I think that Me would too. be actually just right. Yep, can't wait. Yeah, that'll be my next phone. I can't, I can't wait to buy such a thing. Interesting. So so uh, you're you're pretty convinced based on that video that this is it. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a it's crazy that somebody took a video of this. I mean, he he asks that it's clearly an employee meeting. You know, he asks oh, everyone to put away the things. He talks about how serious it is. And it's like somebody actually <laughs> like videotaped this thing. I can't. They're going to be, able, I mean, I, I have to think they're going to be able to tell who it is just from where he was standing in the room or whatever. But <laughs> triangulate. Crazy. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Uh, let me see if I can find that video. I think eWeek uh, has an article about it. Let's see if they have the, the, the name. The way to look it up is uh, look up uh, Nokia C Ray. I think was the the code name for this phone. It's very short. It's basically just Stephen Elop saying, "Look, put away all the cameras. This is an important thing. It's this can't get out. It's a secret." And then he puts it down under the projector, and you can see the phone without the UI <laughs> on it, and it's clearly the same phone. And then the video ends. Oh, so it's enough. It, it's a tease because it's yeah. It's enough to see. Yep. Well, it wouldn't. It would actually make sense that if they're going to do that, uh, if they're going to design the N9, that they wouldn't throw it out. Sure, it is. It's a beautiful design, and you know the the strongest thing about that phone, perhaps, of course, is the camera, right? Uh, that phone has an incredible camera. Well, Nokia is known for that. I mean, my uh, N9 has a 12 megapixel Zeiss. Yeah, glass. I cannot wait to get a smartphone with an awesome camera in yeah. it. And none of the current Windows phones have great cameras. You know, they're okay. But, yeah, I keep looking forward to that day when you can literally just carry around this one thing. Right. And it's your music and podcast player. You can watch movies on a plane or whatever. And you can, you know, take pictures and little home video it's things. Kind of the iPhone 4. It's almost there. You just almost described. <laughs> no, it's, no, no, almost. It's almost there. It's almost Actually, there. you know, there are a couple of things. So the problem with the iPhone 4 is that it doesn't have a removable battery. And so when you're on a cross-country flight, um, you're a little less inclined to maybe use the battery for stupid things. You know, I think that's the one issue I have there. 
And then the camera quality isn't quite there. Although I, I do agree it's one of the better ones for a smartphone. Absolutely. Uh, this is on YouTube. Uh, I'm going to play it before they pull it down, and then you can all put it back up. Yeah, so this is Stephen Elop addressing what appears to be an employee meeting. He's talking about how <laughs> this can't hey, be recorded. Hey, and... hey those, that, that's the, those are the... Can you get audio the, on this? Is there, yeah, you... those are the light scaffolds we're going to have in our uh, collection of our studio. Available <laughs> I recognize those. Don't get, don't get distracted. That is going to live on. <laughs> so, for example... Marco talked about the work in and around Qt and the development of Qt applications. And as we already said uh, yesterday, Qt lives on and actually strengthens because of its engagement. In so what he's saying is that what we've done in the N9 will live on. It's not over. In that device lives on. How long is this video you're Another looking at? 21 minutes. No, no. So I'm sorry. There's a, there's a 55 second version of this where it's right. just the. We just have to find. Video. There it is. Yeah, uh, yeah you got to find the. Should no, I go right, back a little bit? Yeah, this is it. No, no, he doesn't. No, no, no. People, That's not it. You, you got to find the 55 second long version. You'll never find it in Windows this thing. Device, You'll, you you got to get out of this. This won't. The, you can't do it. But this is the. This is the. This is the full version of it. Yeah, but this is the. The, the event. This guy's just doing a Windows Phone demo with a. Oh, okay. Well, I'll find it somewhere. I'm sure it's somewhere. Tika Fergus and Defa Badikan Durga. Basically, there's four things that come to mind. It's a nice combination of. Uh, Stephen doesn't really fit the Scandinavian. Yeah, his uh, aboot. Uh, aboot. <laughs> yeah. He needs a little, a uh, little Swedish chef in there. He could, he could actually pull it off. I gotta send him a Bruins hat. Just work we have to do around bark, bark, series bark. 40 to ensure it continues. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is very clearly, uh, but it's nicely produced, uh, employee. I love that. I really do. You know what? I don't think this is an employee shooting it. This is their video that leaked Oh, out. maybe they turn it off on purpose. Okay, so go to the very end then. Uh, look, Go to the last 50 seconds. Uh, maybe that is it. We're just going to mention that with a bit of music called Hollywood Hills from a Finnish yep. group. Have yeah, a great this summer. Is. I look this is the whole thing. Yeah, sorry. No, you're gonna have to. You gotta find the, the. All right, all right. I wanted. I wanted to interrupt the fine flow of this show. <laughs> well, no, you should find it. It's worth. I mean, it's interesting okay. to see. But. So, so people in the chat room keep sending me links. Let's see if we can. Uh, Stephen, here we go. Here's the 50 second. To put away your cameras. Okay. Turn off all of the recording devices. Yes, sir. I'm serious because I'm going to share something with you that it's a big debate. Should we show this in front of what will be thousands of this people? Is the the world? This is the official recording. That is super okay. confident. It has to be. It's too well done. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right. You're right. Unless he's using a Nokia so phone. <laughs> right? understand how this innovation lives on and how well we as a company are today. He's got something in his hand. Let me show you another new device from Nokia. Put it up here on the camera. Oh, that wasn't the one in his hand. It was in his pocket. Okay, turn off your cameras, everybody sure, watching yeah. at home now. Okay, no pictures, please. No pictures of this. So we what don't. is it? You sort of look at that and say, well, that's what Marco just showed us. It's an N9. Beautiful design, Gorilla Glass. What was that, the pillow-shaped back end? <laughs> yeah. They, they must have found him and cut him off. Right. <laughs> so that's all we saw, but that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, it's the same phone, same hardware, obviously. I and think that's so, yeah. I think it's exactly the same. I think that's yeah. smart. Yeah. Why not? That was, you know, one of the things I got right with that phone. Why not yeah. just keep it? Good. Well, that's actually a great relief to me because I was getting really sad. And you could see why they wouldn't want anybody to know it because they're trying to sell all the Mego versions. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so Microsoft bought Skype. <laughs> well, uh, Microsoft Skype was uh, it's approved. approved. And by the way, it turns out, I got an email from Microsoft about this. You know, the FTC put out a... I don't know. They put out a message on their website, essentially, saying that the deal had been approved by regulators. Right. So, of course, that my, I did, and everyone else did, reported that the FTC approved the deal. But it was actually the U.S. Department of Justice that approved the deal. And it's unclear why it went out through the FTC website, but it did. <laughs> so, anyway, they wrote me to tell me that that's, that was, in fact... I would guess both groups uh, have... You know, the DOJ has antitrust ish, I I regulation, right? They, uh, they both, they, I guess they both, yeah, do. they both have some responsibility in that area. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. So anyway, that's. So when, so now note. that they've approved it, does it, when is it actually, you know, when is the, when, when can yeah. we, when can we, when can we suddenly, when will we suddenly see a Microsoft logo on the video of you? I don't know because there are other antitrust regulators they still have to deal with in Europe. Oh, okay. so it has, it's still not. So it still won't happen. Official, but we have to think. You know, any day. It's just, 
any it's day it. now. It's just say they're not stopping the work of integrating that stuff into their own products. Hey, and, speaking yeah. of HTML5, I, I mm -hmm. want to give kudos to what Microsoft, for my, what they did with SkyDrive. I think that is so sweet. Yeah, and it, it's funny because um, with Apple announcing iCloud and opening up a lot of people's eyes to what's you know to this stuff. I mean, I, I think a lot of people didn't understand that a lot of that stuff was always available. Um, I had an interesting talk with them. So what you're alluding to is the or what you're referring to is the um, the redesign of the SkyDrive website, right? So it SkyDrive works. Being, so it actually works. Yeah. So <laughs> SkyDrive is Microsoft's cloud storage system in any browser. Yeah, the complaint I've always had about SkyDrive isn't so much the web interface. It's that it doesn't integrate very well with anything, you know. Right. And so they're changing that. And I, I, that's very hopeful for the future, you know. Uh, and we'll see how that goes exactly. But the, the way they described it to me was that when they designed SkyDrive, they didn't really see it as a destination. They saw it as a thing that you would use with, like, applications and with other services on the back end. So, for example, you, you could at the time, I think, push you know, a 25 gig attachment, or I'm sorry, a 25 megabyte attachment through Hotmail. But if you stored it on SkyDrive temporarily and they made it a seamless experience, you know, they could bump it up to 50 megabytes and then today right. to 100 megabytes. So there's a benefit to having it, even if you never really explicitly interact with it. Or, or maybe you want to do something like, I want to send a bunch of photos to someone. I'm on vacation. And that's one of the ways that people share photos. So They'll do it via email, you know, and of course you get this email attachment or something. My dad actually shares um, photos through uh, PowerPoint presentations, which is pathetic, but whatever. So they're different. <laughs> they're different. It's, just, it's just bizarre. But anyway, I know a lot of people do that. I think that's a thing. It's, I guess you use the tool you know. I don't yeah. Know. So, older folks seem to like that. Yeah, I don't. I, yeah, it's, it's really funny. I get a lot of attachments, uh, PowerPoint attachments. Yeah. Like, they're slideshows. It's, it's photo slideshows. Yeah. Uh, so they, they built this neat thing in a Hotmail where you can have a, an attractive co photo collection uh, in the email, and then you, it triggers a slideshow. But the photos are actually stored up on the server. You know, they this just is, this is on the iPad on SkyDrive. I mean, it just looks great. Yeah, it's nice. So um, they're, they're working on the integration bits. The only thing they're talking about now is some of the integration that they're doing in Windows Phone. So in, in Mango, SkyDrive is very nicely integrated into the uh, Office Hub, so you can get at your application. Your, um, not your applications, but your uh, documents that are stored there. And, of course, the photos you store in SkyDrive are integrated in the Pictures Hub on Windows Phone. And then they never said this, but the implication is that some sort of integration will be occurring with Windows 8 as well. And we'll look right. forward to that, whatever that might be. But for the majority of people today who access SkyDrive directly, of course, you do that through the web. So the web interface is now very beautiful, especially as you're showing photos there. Yeah, uh, especially this is great. And this is on an iPad again. So fully yep. compatible. I mean, I love that. It's all HTML5. Yep. Uh, yeah, there's no Silverlight, actually. <laughs> and um, no plugins, no, no anything. So, um, Not, yeah, I, nicely nice. done. Yeah. Yep. I forgot that I'd taken a lot of pictures of my... SkyDrive is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like this service that almost no one even knows is there. And it's, it's ill understood and it was ill conceived in some ways, you know, the way they did it originally. But... Um, I feel like I'm one of the few people on earth that even uses the thing, but I think it's nice, you know, the way they've redesigned it. It's it's suddenly very very usable. I think what happened is these were on the Samsung Focus. And, yeah, they were and they just got automatically uploaded. Yep. And what's yeah, great no, is these are nice little bit of integration, right? Pictures of our studio before we did anything to it. So it's yep. it's kind of fun that I have this actually uh, sure. here. Yeah, this is great. We yep. took that out. So anyway, nice, nice, nice job. And in fact, we're doing, uh, and just a bit on iPad today, we're going to do HTML5 sites that work, you know, on iPad without special mobile apps. And this is, this is one of my examples. Yeah. It's just fantastic. Yeah, actually, um, since so many people have asked me this question, I, let me provide a SkyDrive tip. Good. Um, actually, I'll go, I, I need to go there. Um, people who did use SkyDrive, have, uh, I've, I've gotten so many emails about this. They'll, they'll, they, they've, they've written me and said, you know, there used to be this ability to move content around, and I don't see that anymore. Where is it? Um, one of the things I would point out is that in the SkyDrive interface, there used to be an advertisement over on the right side. It was kind of one of those, um, they call them tower ads or, you know, the tall ads. And uh, they've gotten rid of that. And what that, what's over there now is uh, an information pane, and you have to click on something to see it. But there's an information section in there 
that's not expanded by default. So once you're in a location, like in a folder, if you expand that and scroll down, uh, or if you select an item, right, you'll see a move option in there. And that, that's where move is, and also delete. You know, so um, if you're looking at a particular photo or a document or whatever, um, move is there. It's, it's just moved, I guess. <laughs> just the way it's there. Uh, they've moved move, I think, is maybe the way to, the way to do it. And I think, let me just um, let me go back to the folder list. And it's 25 gigs free now. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was before, but yeah. Well, but you couldn't use it with <laughs> You couldn't use it with yeah. so now, So now it's a lot. And I, th I have to say that if you have, uh, if you have uh, a Windows phone, this is really great. I mean, Yeah, so the integration is already there in Windows phone, and that works really nice. Yeah. Um, if you do have Windows and you want to integrate with this, you know, have a drive letter or whatever in Explorer, um, we've talked about this in the past, but if you forget or didn't hear or weren't listening at the time, um, there are two really good solutions for that. And one is called Gladinet. Uh, cloud Desktop, mm -hmm. and let me just make sure I got that name right because it's yeah, CloudNet Cloud Desktop, and the other one is called SD Explorer, uh, SD being SkyDrive, right? Right. And both of these things allow you to essentially map a drive letter in Explorer to SkyDrive, and, and in the case of GladNet, uh, to other cloud services as well. You know, Amazon S3 and Google Docs and whatever else. There's all kinds of different things. But if you want to drag and drop to SkyDrive, you can do that with. Um, you know, I I'm just as a as a, a, a experiment opened a, a mm -hmm. word word for the web on the uh, on the iPad. iPad. It looks like it might be. It's loading, but it looks like it might work. I mean, I, I'm that's. I don't know that that's worked for me. Uh, uh, optimizing your editing experience by opening this document. No, I don't want to open it in Word. Yeah. I like I like what I got. Did you you tried to edit it? And oh, look, it looks like it is working. Yeah. I mean, I'm getting the the toolbar. Let's see if I can edit. Oh, that's what it is. Yeah, so you get some weird, kind of a weird edit box, right? Yeah, that's not working. Yeah. Too yeah. bad. Oh, well, well you, you got my hopes up. You could use it to view documents. Right. It seems like that should work. Right. Well, I'm sure that they'll work on that. I mean, that's that would be very nice. Yeah, I knew there was an issue with that uh, on the iPad. There is a... They're, they're making it easier to get to those Office web apps, too, right? Because you see the icons for those things are now right at the top. Right. That's, what, that's why I hit it. Yeah. And SkyDrive is also now a top-level option with those things in there. And if you used to go to the Office web apps from office.live.com, that now actually redirects you to SkyDrive. So SkyDrive has become the new central location for all that stuff. As it should. Yeah. As it sure. should. Sure. Um, <laughs> the Winklevi have given up. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad for them, actually. I really, I, I really feel like they got screwed. You know? Really? Yeah, I, 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 yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. Let, let me, let, let me put it this way. Um, You're the you, only one I know who thinks the Winklevi got screwed. They, you know, you know they got $60 million, right? Yep. Okay. But I also believe that they were lied to about the valuation of the company, and that's how they arrived at that figure. And that, that's why they... That's not, that's not the big issue. I'm talking more along the lines of them uh, actually starting the thing that became Facebook or uh, having him work on it, and then he went and did it on his own on the side and then screwed him over. I mean, I'm, I'm referring more to that, you know, the original. Yeah, but as, as uh, Larry, Lawrence Summers, the president of Harvard, said mm -hmm. when Aaron Sorkin yep. wrote the words for him. Yes. <laughs> yep. You are men of Harvard. Get another idea, you nitwit. I added oh, that part. On. That's Aaron wouldn't have said that part. You know, uh, you can think of any of the classic tech companies that we all know and love, and you as a historian of the computer industry will know this, you know, Microsoft or Google or Apple, um, all of these companies were started by co-founders together. Um, there were no weird claims of ownership from the outside of in any of these companies' cases. Um, there were people we've forgotten about, maybe, um, but were never, you know, written out of the history books or anything like that deliberately. Only in Facebook's case is there a lot of weirdness around the origins of this company, including, by the way, another case that's still unfolding where uh, someone had purchased an investment in the company and was supposedly promised 50% of it for a very yeah, small Yeah, that's a No, no, I'm not, not, I'm not saying it's true. I'm just saying it's interesting that Facebook's history is so dicey. Yeah, and there's, and, I understand. And, 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 you know, that's all. But I think, you know, it's one thing to have an idea, another thing to implement it. 
uh, right, but <laughs> it's one thing to have an idea, tell someone about it, ask them to implement it, have him agree to implement wow. it, and yeah. then have him implement it separately on the side, then start his own company, and then not, never pay those guys. So I know what you're saying, but I don't know. I don't know. Look, it's over. Yeah, whatever. It's over. Those two six foot five. Daniel Affleck looking <laughs> the freaks of nature can just move on with their own rich lifestyle, I guess. Yeah, they got plenty of money for it. That's the thing. It's like they're not they're not living down at the YMCA. Oh. No. I mean they're they're like Yeah. <laughs> they're in the they're the upper crest as it is. Probably so. what the, what happened is the lawyer said, uh, dudes, you can appeal to the Supreme Court, but you know that sixty million you got? <laughs> yeah. We're gonna eat it well, all. Well the other thing is so um uh, the 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 primary question or complaint at issue now in the current case, the one that was just dropped, was the valuation of the company. Um, they thought that they right. were yeah, uh, screwed by a, by a factor of four. Right. The funny thing is, if they had accepted the settlement and just taken the money, right. it would have it would today be worth that four times that they were hoping that they right. expected to get. Right. So, I think what they realized was, you know, this company is on an upward trajectory. Should take the money now. Stock's going to keep going up. We're going to be all set. What am I looking at, Leo? Why am I? Why am I saying? This? Oh, baby! I haven't seen this ad. This is great. <laughs> so on Tuesday, this was not in my show notes, but thank you for understanding me. The third and no doubt final map pack for Call of Duty Black Ops. Is coming out. <laughs> do I know Paul or do I know Paul? <laughs> I've not actually seen this ad though. I like this. Um, I will. Uh, the one little bit of trivia I'll supply is that one of these maps, it's the one that's a golf course, is based on uh, the cliff map. Uh, I'm not getting the name exactly right, but the cliff something map. It was the Japanese map from um, Call of Duty World at War. Oh, neat. And yeah, this it's one's been cool. restyled. And they, th these guys have done that a couple times. I, I like when I see some of the good old, you know, maps from the old games come back. Yeah. Uh, styled, you know, so they've turned it into okay, a Okay, don't course. look. We've got a kindergarten teacher in the room. She's not happy with the zombie mayhem. Those aren't real zombies. Don't worry. No, yeah, just, no, no, no zombies, zombies were, were harmed. This game. And I like the... Uh, so that's those are out Tuesday. Yep. And I like it that they, um, they, they uh, use the Rolling Stones. Tuesday is going to be a terrible day for me because I'm going to be in New York for the Office 365 launch, and I'm going to have to wait until I get home to play that. I wonder if I could bring, maybe I should bring oh, my Xbox. Oh, I'm so sorry. I know. <laughs> We're going to take a break. When we come back, bastards, <laughs> Paul will have our Windows Weekly Tip of the Week, a Windows 7 app pick, and a very important announcement for Windows Phone 7 users. You will not want to miss. But first, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you that you must get an account at Netflix.com. If you don't have one already, go to Netflix.com slash twit. Thank you very much. We now return you to the program already in progress. Do I have to say any more? You know about Netflix, don't you? You know about the watch instantly, which is really, really awesome. Really, really awesome. Because basically you've got tens of thousands of movies and TV shows here that you could just watch on your Xbox 360, on your PS3. By the way, I, I just uh, I bought the Family Gold Pack so I could watch it on my Xbox 360. Ninety-nine bucks for a year—it's a good deal. We get four uh, four uh, accounts on Xbox Live. Uh, but this is seven ninety-nine a month. But I'm going to give it to you free for a month. How about that? Netflix.com/slash twit. If you go there for if you're not a member of Netflix, you really ought to be. So watch watch how fast this starts up in Microsoft Silverlight. By the way, uh, you, I just clicked Ponyo which is a fine little manga film for you all. Yes, the Power Rangers are on there, too. Absolutely right, Fowler. Netflix.com slash twit. Sign up today, and you could be watching movies this quickly for seven ninety nine a month. Free for the first 30 days. Uh, we now return you to Windows Weekly. I, you know, I do this quickly because I know you're already members. But I, uh, one more thing. I just want to say one more thing. If you don't, uh, if you if you have a family member who doesn't have an account, maybe that's the case. That some of your family members don't yet know about Netflix. Tell them, give them the free month, and then it's a great. You can buy the gift certificates and everything. Boy, even the Disney logo looks good on this. I think we should begin all our shows with this instead. Disney logo, yeah. except it could be over the Twit Cottage or whatever. You're yeah, make that the Twit Cottage. They wouldn't sue us, would they? No, they're nice people. No, sweethearts. Uh, all right, your Windows <coughs> Weekly 
tip of the week. <clears throat> uh -huh. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> Careful. I've, I learned in I've, the New York Times this week that uh, milk does not cause more phlegm. So oh, consider, yeah, so have some more Consider that myth bashed. <laughs> consider that. Have more. <laughs> um, yeah, so the tip of the week is this one's courtesy of Byron Adams, who wrote in to tell me there's a, there's a utility for Windows, Windows, just for Windows, called Rain Meter, um, which by default... In Do the I default, have to leave my windows outside? <laughs> no. That is a it's kind of sort of a sidebar kind of a thing. But they have a Windows 8 theme for it. And when you apply it to your desktop and you turn off your uh, desktop icons, it makes your desktop look and work a lot like Windows 8. Ooh. It's actually pretty cool. I mean, you can configure Ooh. some of the tiles and there's weather and email and you can link it to your Gmail account and all that stuff. So That's pretty nifty. Yeah, it's actually pretty good. And it's pretty straightforward installing it. You have to install RainMeter first, obviously, and then the add-in and... Um, and you can just select that UI from there and you're good to go. But um, I have a link in the show notes to a page that explains it in painful detail. If you need help uh, running setup.exe. <laughs> so um, feel free to avail yourself of that. Uh, next, we have the Windows 7 app pick of the pick. week. Yeah. This one I got just kind of by accident. I just... I, that's like, the best way to get I just, software. I got four last week, and I now all of a sudden I got... I software update, now here it is. It's five. Yep, Firefox 5. So uh, Firefox threatened that they would do this, or my familiar, <laughs> Mozilla threatened. I would, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so they pretty much adopted the Chrome development model. And, you know, where the... the, the you know, the, the version number sort of doesn't make as much, right. uh, isn't as important. Just ignore the version number. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, when, when Firefox was three, four years out for every version, you know, 2.0, 3.0, that was a big deal, 4.0. But 5, 6, 7, they should all happen this year, right? So maybe we just got to start thinking of this thing as Firefox and move on. But I found it interesting that they actually delivered this. So if you're using Firefox 4, Firefox 5 is not a major update. It's basically... Uh, some security fixes and some small things. But obviously, if you're still in 3, whatever, 3, 6, whatever it was, um, this is the new UI for Firefox 4 and all that stuff. So um, they are committed to doing this new, you know, speedy development thing. I, I have to give them some credit. I mean, these guys were... Mozilla basically makes one product that matters, the browser. And I don't think they've ever hit a release date, ever. Yeah. yeah. Until now, until this one. Yeah, so they, they not only hit it, they jumped it. Yep. Yeah, so good for them. By the there way, just uh, well, a new feature on Windows Weekly. Yep. The uh, Twit Cottage lunch menu. Okay. Today in the solarium, we'll be serving grilled Mayan-style chicken, potato salad, coleslaw, grilled asparagus, corn on the cob, carrot jicama salad with avocado, baby green salad, sugar snap peas, sautéed with trumpet mushrooms, peanut butter cookies, and watermelon for dessert. Please continue on. You know, so much of that food could only be served in California. <laughs> it's um, it's sad. It, it's it's delicious. See, I'm trying to compete with uh, Google for now. Yeah. By uh, having is that, is that uh, corn on the cob grilled in the yeah in the gr gr in the, grilled in the in the, in the husk in the husk yeah. Our chef uh, specializes in uh, healthful, delicious food for yep. everyone. Okay. <laughs> I just think it's a new feature. I can tell this uh, podcast is winding down because your lunch is <laughs> it's arrived. It's a new feature. It arrived early this week. And finally, I'm actually very excited about this. Finally, I, you on know, so seven. <laughs> I was at dinner last night with my family. And I looked at my phone and it's Plants vs. Zombies. Yay! And I said, oh my God, Plants vs. Zombies. That's so great. And Mark, hey, my son Mark says, what's... What's so exciting over here? And I said, oh, Plants vs. Zombies is on my phone. And he goes, oh, nice. What is this, 1999? <laughs> I finished that on the iPod like three years ago. <laughs> hey. Uh, it was unbelievable. It ain't a phone until it's got, well. Yeah. You have Angry well, you, Birds. Not yet, but I, next week, I think. You know, uh, I've been talking about this uh, uh, kindergarten teacher, Amanda, who's in our studio. I, yeah. Perhaps you didn't know. I don't know how you would. She is in the top 5% of all Angry Birds players on Game Center. In Game Center? The, well, the ripoff of Xbox Live that's on iOS? That, yes. That Game Center? But I suspect, I may be wrong, that I, the vast majority of accomplished Angry Birds players play on an iPhone. 
Damn you, Laporte. <laughs> um, actually, that's incredibly impressive. Five percent. She says, yeah. I'm all three stars. I said, of course you are. You're much more Is that than on that. the original Angry Birds or yes. is that on? I asked her okay. that too. So it's not actually, Seasons. It's not Rio. It's the yeah. Seasons was hard. Rio's easier. But, Rio's way uh, easier. The original one, getting three stars is actually very difficult. Oh, no. This this woman is is a master yeah. of accomplishment. She told me. Now, she's a kindergarten teacher. so She's like a ninja. She's a ninja. She told me she plays only during nap time. Oh, so she gets plenty of time in every day. <laughs> I was blown away. It's like, wow. Well, it's bad enough these guys get the summer off. She gets like nap time every day. <laughs> no, seriously, what is that? What? They're little. I work like three hours a day and I play eight they're, hours angry. They're five-year-olds, six-year-olds. They're kids. They need a nap. I need a nap. When my kids were little, they would run around the house like dogs. You know, <laughs> Does she like send them around the building? Like, why do you guys go to a lap around the building? <laughs> we'll take a nap. Go run. Enjoy. I'm going to have her uh, sit down and just show us some Angry Birds tips here. You should. Yeah. Pretty I impressive. I told you about that flight home from Europe. We uh, Last summer we went to Germany. Yeah. And we got on the plane and, and my son again says, you know, how long is this flight going to be? And I sit down like six hours. He's like, oh, six hours. And I said, Mark, this is like six hours of uninterrupted Angry Birds time. You're psyched. And then the woman who was sitting next to him said, oh, you guys play Angry Birds? Uh-oh. And then her friends who were in the, front, the seat in front of them all came over the back of the seat. My kids and these uh, young adults, probably in their 20s, they spent the entire flight showing each other screens and giving each other tips. They, it's they, very he problematic. Didn't, he didn't want to get off the plane by the time it was over. Yeah. You know, classic. It's, it's the new, it, frankly, it's the new, um, what? I can't even think. It's, it's the, the new, new what? Angry Birds is the new Angry Birds. It's the new, there's nothing, there's never, it's the nev, there's never been anything like it. Well, you know, like in the sense that Doom was obviously a big deal in that day and age on right. the PC. Uh, Halo was the big thing in that day and age oh, it's on the Xbox. bigger than that. Well, I, but okay. I gotta then, say, you gotta have Plants vs. Zombies. That's that is yes. That's like the John the Baptist of Angry in the sense Birds. that there's it, Angry Birds. It prepares the way. Yes, it's the next step down. Right. So but, I don't know why the plants and the zombies have this thing. I don't understand the plot, but it does look nice on Xbox. Uh, I love it. On the have you Xbox. played it? It's the greatest oh, game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Amanda, good. are you it's really good? good at, did you play Plants vs. Zombies before? I, no, she never played. So oh. she's lucky. Well, next week, <laughs> I, I think my tip will probably be Angry Birds. Yay! And, and finally, we have achievements. You know, actual Xbox Live achievements. That's pretty cool. I that's can't pretty wait. cool. I actually prefer uh, Plants vs. Zombies to Angry Birds, but that's just interesting. Me. Yeah, interesting. Paul Thorat, our time has come to say goodbye to all the family. As it always must. As it always must at some point. Paul is, of course, the editor-in-chief of the Supersite for Windows, windsupersite.com, and the author of Windows Phone Secrets and uh, soon-to-be Windows 8 Secrets, and, of course, uh, many Paul. other fine books Paul. like the Delphi 3 Super Bible. Paul, um, if people want to watch this show, yeah, they could tune in Thursdays. We do it roughly 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern at live.twit.tv. That's 1800 UTC. Or you could watch After the Fact anytime by going to twit.tv slash w. W. Hello. Classic. Please be my son's friend. <laughs> Paul, have a great week. We'll see you next time on Windows Weekly.